If you have your Bibles, 1 Kings, we're going to be 19, chapter 19, and we're going to be in verse 11 to 21. 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. Let me read for us. It's going to be on the screen as well. If you, most of you guys have Bibles, right? Your apps. So. Or we'll just read from our, our Bibles. It's okay. All right, verse 11. Let's, let's read together. And he said... This is, this is God speaking to Elijah. Elijah, uh, is this conversation. Go out and stand on the mount, mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. But after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And They seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you will anoint Hazael to be king of Syria and Jehu, the son of Nimshi. You shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Maholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will, I will leave 7,000 Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing the 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then Eli Elisha rose and went after Elijah and assisted him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. How are you guys doing today? I've had a pretty intense pack week. I think I just need a moment. And maybe some of you guys have had that as well. Uh, if you didn't, you can pray for me. But let's just take a moment. Just say, Lord, uh, I calm my heart. I calm my schedule. I silence my voice. I want to hear from you. Can, can we take a moment to do that before we start? I just really felt like this is important. All right? Close your eyes for... 15 seconds. Go to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for today. As we sang, it's not who we are. It's not what we have done. It's who you are and what you have done, Lord. So even now, all of us come from different places of how our week was. And I, I just pray, Lord, you would silence all other voices. Silence our own voice and our worries and fears about what's coming up and what's next week and true self and family, all that stuff. Would you help us to sit before you today and hear from your word? Holy Spirit, do more than we can ever do on our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we have been studying the life of Elijah, and this is the final sermon in this particular series. Uh, we've been in the latter part of 1 King, last several weeks, and last time we were together before the retreat, Elder Charles did a wonderful job of unpacking much of the passage that we read. So I'm not going to be going through all of it, but I did want to consider how Elijah must have felt as he's all, all alone in that cave. Remember, just to give you a little bit of context, if you're just joining us, this is a time of Elijah's life where after this great victory 
right? This famous story about Elijah against many of these false prophets. Elijah prays for the fire. Fire arrives, and Elijah thinks there's going to be great repentance. But then all of a sudden, Elijah hears from the evil queen that she wants his life. So Elijah, after this great mountaintop experience of faith, he runs. He runs away. First time in Elijah's, in our story, Elijah is deathly afraid. This is a guy who, who's willing to go to the brook and wait for the ravens to prepare, prepare him food, willing to move away from the brook and, and go live in a widow's house. And all of these experiences and first time in our story, just as Elder Charles talked about last week, we see Elijah that's totally human. Not too long ago, he was standing on Mount Carmel, and there was a huge crowd and wonderful, wonderful showing of who God was. Yet the story sh quickly shifts in chapter 19 from Mount Carmel, the great, great event in Mount Carmel, to Mount Horeb. He's not just in Mount Horeb, but he's all alone in a cave, depleted of any strength or joy. In fact, in this conversation, Elijah tells God, God, I'm done. I'm good. Here is my Tajikso. What's Tajikso? Here's my resignation letter. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm out. And perhaps some of us or many of us have been where Elijah is in our own faith journey. I know I have more than once as following Jesus and being in ministry. I know exactly how Elijah felt. And perhaps many of you today might describe our current state more like Elijah in a cave than Elijah in Mount Carmel. And we catch ourselves, maybe if, if you're there, we catch ourselves saying, there was a time in my life I was deeply passionate about God and I love God and if God told me to do something, I was more than willing to do it. And we see perhaps someone younger, someone who is new to faith and just loving the Lord. We look at them, perhaps maybe little, with a little bit jadedness and say, well, I, I was there. Wait till you, you, you get to the cave. The cave in our story represents, it symbolizes absolute depletion of strength and joy. Right, this Elijah is spent. He is exhausted. There is no more faith that he can muster up here. And we are reminded once again through the life of Elijah. Yeah, there are Mount Carmel experiences of faith, but there also there is also Mount Horeb, the cave, the loneliness. We're also reminded the faith is not a easy road. It is a narrow gate. There will be times of great passion and joy, but also times of depletion and discouragement. And that's just part of what it means to follow Jesus. Today we'll look at three things. I'll, I'll divide uh, this sermon into three parts. One, reasons for being at the cave. Two, how one can leave the cave of our faith. And three, we'll wrap up our, our time with a few key points. You know, Talking about revival, I grew up in Northern Virginia, Evan, Northern Virginia. Anyone else Northern Virginia? Right, Northern Virginia, all right, awesome. Uh, in the 90s, late 80s and early 90s, there was this wonderful revival that took place among Korean American churches. Uh, and I have pastors that are much older than me. Uh, we'll sit down and we'll talk and I'll tell them I'm from Virginia. And they always tell me stories of doing ministry in Virginia in the 90s. They would say, if anybody, if any of their friends were discouraged from ministry, they'd be like, just go to Virginia, right? Just go to Virginia, and you preach one sermon, you're going to feel like Elijah and Mount Carmel. There was a band named Alpha and Omega at the time, made up of, like, first 1.5 generation Korean Americans. And none of them really, so minute, the revival started happening. People, young people started coming to the Lord. So they were doing these conferences, and they had to, like, someone had to lead worship. And they told me, like, these guys were just chosen because they were just available. And one of the, one of the pastors, he played, he played the bass. So that was his role. But he said, I mean, I knew nothing, I know nothing about playing the bass. But he would simply stand there, right, and just, like, pretend to play. 
and, and just peep, the young people would come to the Lord, they were, and it was just amazing time. Um, many of the pastors still talk about just that revival that happened in, in the late 80s and 90s. In fact, many of current pastors that are in ministry, a little bit older than me, they, they were birthed out of, out of those conferences and those, uh, that revival. I remember attending those like revivals or, or Saturday night services or worship services and uh, the pastor would preach a passionate sermon and would say, who wants to go to missions, right? Uh, long term, right? And half the room would come up. It was, it was, it was crazy. It was, it was so wild that actually when we're in youth group, uh, we, we were Friday night, right? We would start singing at 8 o'clock. Uh, around 11 o'clock, parents would come in and try to shut down the service because they were just waiting for us. Because we, we just love the Lord. I remember our youth group, we went on a retreat. And the whole retreat, get this, right? This, these, these are, I was, a, I was a seventh grade, sixth grade to uh, senior in high school. The whole retreat was about reading through the New Testament. If, I, if we did that last week, like we told everyone, hey, all we're going to do is we're going to read through the New Testament. I'm sure you guys are like, I'm not going to that retreat. But I remember at that retreat, we were just reading, literally like the, the volunteer teachers and pastor would come to the front and we would just sit back and we were reading we read through the whole New Testament. Right? I, I'm, I'm thankful it wasn't Old Testament, right? New Testament is much more exciting. But, I mean, we're just kids. But the fact that there was so much joy and excitement for God's word. And I just remember, right, just how we loved the Lord at the time. And that was a special moment. I, I took that season for granted, but I remember that was a special moment. Now in Northern Virginia, I mean, you go there, oh, it's, there's, there's no revival happening right now, Right? You go to church, it's like, whoa, 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 like people are upset here. But there was a time, right, that's Mount Carmel. And perhaps you can also remember, right, maybe you grew up in the church, maybe, maybe not, but you could remember a time when all you wanted to do was worship the Lord, right? You just, you're just new to Christianity or God touched you in a powerful way and all you wanted to do was come to service, sing these songs, pray, be in the Word, then maybe time passes and life happens and COVID happens. Adulthood happened. We left our wonderful college bubble and we went into adulthood and we realized not everyone loved Jesus. And, and, and over the years, you look back to those seasons and you're like, man, I, was, I really loved the Lord at one point. But for Elijah, he was, he, was, he was all good. He was so excited. He was taunting the false prophets. And he won this amazing battle. And one word from the queen. That's all it took to crack the wall. Sometimes that's what it takes. One word of criticism. One painful experience. One unmet expectation. But really, how did Elijah get here? I mean, I think we really need to think about how did Elijah get here? He was just this man with no fear, so much passion. It's almost like we're reading the story of two very different people, chapter 18 and chapter 19. And Elder Charles alluded to this two weeks ago, right? When, when God asks Elijah, right, he asks Elijah, same question over and over again. Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And from Elijah's answer, we, we find out something very human about his response. What we hear from Elijah's response is really what? When you boil it down to it, it's self-pity. I got nobody. I got no friends. I'm so lonely. I'm not going to sing the song. And also, it's self-righteousness. I'm the only one. God, I've been faithful. Every, and, and maybe he, he's not so honest, but he's basically saying, everybody else, they don't love you, God. I love you, but I'm the only one. That's what he's saying. He repeats that, this idea. And, and Elder Charles talked about how that's actually not true, but God allows him to, to vent and lament, right? And that's verse 15. He says, I'm the only one left. Everyone has proven to be unfaithful, as brave as 
Elijah has proven himself, right? He was still a frail human like you and I. When push came to shove, Elijah, this great prophet, was still human like you and I. And his misstep, the reason why he is all alone in the cave instead of being still in Mount Carmel with people, is because he assumes that there is no one else. It's up to me. If I can't do it, no one else will. So much of modern Christianity, if you think about popular Christianity, I've talked about this through this series, modern Christianity and its theology is built on theology of self. So this idea of me, myself, and I, and my relationship with Jesus. And the most popular preachers today, if you, if you go on YouTube, and you type preaching, most popular preachers today, they, 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 they get people's attention by selling people on their dreams. Right? And, and they tell people how God desires and God wants what's best for their life. How God wants them to overcome their current struggles to become their best version of themselves. And often the message is about what? It's about you, it's about your vision, your purpose, your goal in life, and how God can help you and assist you to get there. Not very different from self-help books. Not very different from other life coaches. It's why? Because it sells. You can get people in the door. You can get enough likes and subscription. Because if we're honest, as humans, that's what we want. We want to be able to worship God that would help us, that would assist us, that would walk along with us so that we can really get to what we want. And this is exactly the reason why Elijah, the great prophet Elijah, finds himself at the cave. We turn to each other really quick. I know little, this is uncomfortable. And just gently tell each other, it's not about you. Turn around, you know. Nicely, nicely, okay? Not, not in a mean way, okay? You, you and your spouse got into an argument, don't, don't turn, to, turn on someone else. It's not about you. Friends, it's not about our vision. It's not about our purpose. It's not about what we desire out of our life. It's not about living our best life here and now. In fact, the only way out of these caves that we experience in life, in our walk with Jesus, it is simply to recognize that our lives, yes, it does matter. I'm not saying our lives don't matter. It does matter. God loves you. God wants this, this life for you. But, but it's really important that we recognize our lives are part of much bigger story that our lives yes important but we're not the main thing we're not the main event that we're not the author or the perfecter of our own lives that there is someone else and scripture continues over and over and over and over and over should I continue over and over and over reminds us that there's a creator God and we're not the creator God himself Without that realization, and, and I, I'm telling you, it's not like people just get there. It's, it's you, you gradually, you forget the gospel and you, you forget the word and, and you do churchy things and you could easily get there. So we really need to be, be aware of even our own hearts, what we listen to, what we desire. Otherwise, we're going to be like Elijah, stuck in the cave. Self-pity. Self-righteousness. Pastor Tim Keller wrote a wonderful book, Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. Uh, we're sharing it in a Mongolia team, and one of the sisters uh, reminded me of this book. And, and Pastor Tim Keller, he talks about how the gospel should transform who we are inside out. And he says in this book, talking about true humility, he says, true gospel humili humility means... I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. 
How hard is that? That's really hard. Sometimes we're talking to somebody as you were introducing yourself, two-minute thing. How many of you guys were thinking, what do I say next? You're not even listening because we're like, is it about me? You know, you have a conversation with your friends, and you're sharing about your life, and you have that one friend that always wants to talk about themselves and connect, like, their lives into what you're telling them instead of just listening. This is hard. Pascal says, in fact, I stopped thinking about myself, the freedom of self-forgetfulness, the blessed rest that only self-forgetfulness brings. True gospel humility means I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. It's in this book, he talks about it's not thinking less of myself, the way the world would say. It's not about hating myself because when you hate yourself, there is a sense of pride as well. And I won't go into that because of time. But, but really what Pastor Keller is saying is, you know what? If you truly receive the gospel, understand what Jesus did for you, you're going to be able to say, I'm part of the story. I'm not the main story. And some of you guys are like, man, this is depressing. I'm not coming to this church again. Perhaps for many of us, deep down inside, right, if we, when we find ourselves in the cave, perhaps even Elijah, even though the text doesn't tell us, what we want to do is return to the days of Mount, Mount Carmel. When we find ourselves depleted, discouraged, and upset, or maybe far away from God, what we desire is perhaps, hey, I want to go back to those days. I want to be 18 again. I want to be 17 again. I want to be like that when I, the first week that I met the Lord and how hungry I was for His Word and relationship. And I think that's the common trap that many of us fall into when we find ourselves in the cave, jaded, upset. What we want is we want to go back. We look back to those years with great fondness, and we grieve about the fact that we are no longer there. Yet, friends, faith, if you, if you look at the story, if you look at what God tells Elijah next, faith isn't simply about going back to Mount Carmel experiences. It isn't simply about living a life of great victory and joy and excitement and fervor faith. That's part of it. More importantly, it is about remaining committed to Jesus through the ups and downs, left and right. It is about being committed to where God may call us despite the fact that you find yourself in a cave. You find yourself in a hard, difficult place. And, and maybe, can I be a little bit more depressing? Maybe you will never experience Mount Carmel again. Maybe your relationship with the Lord, maybe from here it's slowly you're not, you might not experience what you've experienced. I, I don't know. Maybe God will take you back to experience those things. But maybe for many of us, we may never go back to Mount Carmel. We may never be able to experience the things that we've experienced. Elijah never did. After this, what does God tell him? God says, Elijah, go anoint this man. He's going to replace you. Imagine going to your boss, and your boss says, hey, why don't you go train Bob? He's going to replace you. That's not a great conversation, right? But God tells Elijah, hey, Elijah, there's Elisha, Elijah 2.0. He's coming. And you're going to go train him, and you're going to be replaced. His ministry is going to come to an end, God tells him. And he is to go and anoint this man, Elisha, who's going to take over who's going to carry on the, the role of prophet. Now, how do we transition out of the cave? So this is the second section. How do we transition to get out of our own caves? When we feel stuck in our faith, when we feel like we're, we just got no energy, we just got no passion, how do we get out? Friends, what we need is not another Mount Carmel experiences. And then the text makes it clear to Elijah, it is... Perhaps time for us to come along to someone else. Perhaps someone younger, someone who's new to faith, someone who's struggling, someone who's in difficult and hard places. Come alongside of them and pour into them that they would also be able to experience Mount Carmel. Just as Elijah was sent for Elisha. Right? In our community, we have wonderful, wonderful opportunity to be able to Sow into one another. 
all of us can find someone else who is where we were in life not too long ago. I remember, right, Jinso, it's hard, right? Having, like, having a young toddler and then having another baby, it's like you're drowning and they give you another baby, right? It feels like that. First, like, third kid, forget about it, right? It's hard. I see Jinso, I'm like, my, oh my goodness, it's hard. But, but many of us have been where Jinso was with a new toddler and new baby and how to walk. With. So we could come along and say, Jinso, let me help you. Let me hold that baby for you. Let's meet up. Let's pray. Let's talk. And we can share, because not because we're this mighty disciple like Paul and we want to raise up Timothy, but because we've, we've been there and we know how, hard, how, how difficult that is and we can walk along them. We have singles, we have married people without kids, we have married people with one child, married people with multiple children, married and kids are out of the house. I mean, we have all seasons of life here, so we have wonderful opportunity for you and I to be able to walk life together. Discipleship doesn't have to be a classroom thing. It, 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 in fact, discipleship is just walking alone, eating, meeting together. Okay, yeah, meet together to eat. Okay, meeting, eating, right, sharing, sharing the word, praying for one another. That's discipleship. And so we, we have to be intentional about sowing ourselves. If you are in a place where Elijah is, hey, get, get out of your own head and say, let me reach out to someone else. Let me see if I could help someone else. In our, in our church, we have wonderful number of kids, and more are coming. Right? We, have, we got babies coming this next season. Um, and if, if, if you guys are, like, married and you guys are like, if you're in our community, you might have a baby, okay? You, you got you to be careful. Everybody's having a baby in our community, right? With these wonderful children, and we can totally pour into them as a community, Right? Through our kids team, our pre, pre-teens team, we have opportunities. You can volunteer to mentor orphan college students through Oak Tree Project. You can volunteer to tutor North Korean refugee college students through our community. Young Life, right? Arno and, and Corey, they're leading this youth uh, college ministry, college high school ministry. You can pour into them through them. There, there, there are endless opportunities for us to be able to pour into the future generation. Not to mention all the parents, right? We we think about parenting, right? My daughter is eight and four, and the 80-year-old, you know, so like when when my second daughter turned four, it was like really sweet. No more diapers, no more like sleeping with us, sort of. She comes over every night, but, you know, like life got better. But then our our first 80-year-old became like a teenager overnight, and I'm just like, I don't even know how to, it's like a different type of struggle, right? Parenting um, is hard. Yet, yet parenting, part of parenting as Christians, it is not simply to, to, to keep them alive and feed them good food and give them good education. Because we, we've seen this, this movie. We've seen our first generation immigrant parents do all of their, these things and send their kids to these great schools and these kids no longer follow the Lord. I've seen it over and over and over again. Parents, God has entrusted you and I with this profound responsibility of nurturing and guiding our children through this most formative years. When kids are young, days feel like weeks, I know, right? When kids are young, Hours feel like days, and weeks feel like years. Yet in the blink of eye, like I seen my daughter who's so sweet, like she's like, like toddler and turned like teenager. She doesn't even talk to us. We're like, what's going on? Right? It's like scary. Did you know, according to statistics, only 95, so 95% of the time we have with our children, 90, 90 to 95, some say 90, is spent between 0 to 18. When they leave the house, that's 5%. I, think about you guys, right? Like, think about me. I left home at 18. I've never lived with my parents. They live in the States. I live here. I see them maybe twice, once in two years. Right? It, it feels long, but that's it. When they turn 18, we're done. After that, they're not going to want to hang out with us, all right? 
They're not going to want to spend time with us. So this, this is it. Even though it feels like, oh, forever, I want to get them out of the house, boarding school year. No. This is amazing. This is it. It's so, it's so, it's just, it's going to go by really quick. So we got to make our, our next 5 to 15 or how many years, make it count. And raising God-fearing children doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen by chance. Right? Do you know why? We know why. Because kids are amazing observers. Right? Kids are amazing at telling us the truth. Parents, I don't know, not so much, right? But kids are, am- like sometimes my daughter would be like, Dad, you drive like, you drive like a scary man. You like, you scare people. I'm just like, no, I don't. What are you talking about? Right? Like, I'm like, stop. But I know, like, I'm like, no, I'm trying to explain to her. Like, oh, yeah, but that guy was like a terrible driver. They need to learn. I'm giving all these dudes. But deep down inside, I'm like, she's right. Like, she sees right through me. Right? Sometimes my daughter says things about me, and I'm just like, oh, I hope, I wish it wasn't true, but they are true. That's the reality because they see me. I can't hide from them. And again, to our kids, it's not our words that have the most profound, profound impact. We think as parents, oh, we tell our kids how to live their life, it's going to be good. Talk to any seasoned parents. They'll tell you it's not what you say, it's what we do. In fact, kids are so good at finding that gap. Like my daughter would tell me, Dad, you said this, but you do this like every other day. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, Dad's wrong, right? I have to like apologize. So when you and I treat corporate worship as something optional, secondary, our kids know. When we focus all of our energy in their academics versus their spirituality, kids know. It's not what we say, it's what we do. And our kids, they're not dumb. So we really need to pray as parents. We really need to talk to our spouse and say, man, we need to do this right. We need to be intentional. And we also need the singles in our community. We need your help. You know why? Because our kids like you guys more than they like us. You guys are the cool uncles and aunts. Like Lo- Emma, like, loves you guys. I'm just like, that. I'm not that impressed, right? But Emma loves you guys. Emma just wants to hang out with you guys. And we need you guys as you're here and you see our kids to love on them, to walk with them, to show them what it means to be godly singles. We need a whole village to raise. He likes it. She likes it. All right. We need you guys. All right? Let's pray for our parents. Pray for us that we would be able to do this well, right? We have an amazing opportunity. So many people are leaving the church. So many people, so many things that we have an opportunity to reverse that. And we have an opportunity to raise up these wonderful children to come to love the Lord. Amen? Amen? All right, third and final observation. The end and the new beginning. Verse 19, Elijah, Elijah finally leaves the cave, finds Elisha, who is plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. As soon as Elijah sees Elisha, he casts his own cloak over him, right? Elijah tells him, hey, you're the next guy. Elisha was a farmer, very clear. He was farming. Even in the passage when Elijah came for Elisha, he was plowing to prepare for the new crops. And verse 21, they have this interaction. Elijah puts his cloak on him. Elisha says, let me go. Say goodbye to my parents. Let me take care of a few things and I'll follow you. And Elisha goes back home and what does he do? He kills all of his oxen, prepares the plow, the plow, the, the tool for farming. Right? Remember, these are the tools that he has relied on throughout his life to provide for himself and his family. And he puts them on fire and he feeds the meat to the, to, the, to the rest of the people, and he leaves. It's crazy, right? Elisha displays his radical obedience. Because Elisha could have said, hey, maybe I'll try this for like a year. Now, I'll, I'll give it a shot. When I went to ministry, I was like, maybe I'll do it for like six months and see if I like it. He could have said, he could have lent it to someone else and said, you know what, I'll just call, collect interest. I'll come back maybe in a year. Uh, you know, but Elisha says, no, no, no. If I'm going to do this, if I'm going to follow the Lord, if I'm going to follow Elijah, that's it. I'm not going to create opportunities for me to come back. I'm not going to even tempt myself 
to be able to come back. So he does radical obedience and basically gets rid of all these tools and all these things that gave him meaning and purpose. And this is exactly what Jesus said about following him in Luke chapter 9. Later, many years later, Jesus says, perhaps he was thinking about Elisha. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Elijah knew, Elisha knew that there was no turning back from this call. Here's a man who truly understood what it means to serve. The word for servant in Greek, we know this is doulos. And doulos literally means slave, voluntary slave. No slave can tell their master how this relationship is going to work. When we come to Jesus, friends, when we commit ourselves to Jesus and says, Jesus, we want you to be our master and we'll be your slave, it requires that we sacrifice all that defined us in our past life. It requires that we learn to let go. Right, let go of our vision for life, our p- own purpose, our plans to retire, our own bucket list, whatever the finest number that you're going for, our own, defi- our own definition of what is good life. For, for others of us, it's about letting go of unhealthy relationships and attachments that continue to drag us back. For others of us, it's, our sen- it's, it's about letting go of our own sense of security and comfort and how much we love comfort and security, right? I went to Mongolia in May on a vision trip. I used to love going on a mission trip. And I felt at this time, like, I am so, I, I so love comfort and convenience. And whenever things are uncomfortable, I was like, big baby. I was like, complaining, like, I'm like I, want to, I want to stay in a nice hotel. Like, I'm like, complaining. I'm in a nice place. I just, just this idolatry of wanting comfort and and convenience what about validation from others friends when we choose to serve and follow christ not everybody will understand our choices and decisions 17 years ago when i told my parents who are pastors that their son is going to quit their job and go into seminary guess what their reaction was they're like, no, you know, the Korean, like, no, that has, like, deep, like, sadness. Han, like, no. Like, I hear my mom, but she was just like, I was like, you did, like, what can I do it, right? And they had their reasons, right? But I remember, like, it really broke their heart. Um, people might be disappointed. People that you love might be disappointed. Because following Jesus, from the very beginning, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your crown. No, he didn't say take up your crown. He says, take up your cross. Because following Jesus is a costly endeavor. It is a humbling journey, but it is also a rewarding one if we can do it. In fact, I would argue there is nothing more rewarding and comforting than being and living and operating in the will of God. Amen? Let me conclude here. Elijah was a man who walked by faith and not by sight for the most part, right? Chapter 19, okay, we'll give him a break, right? But for the most part, Elijah really showed that he was a man of faith. Elijah was a man whose affection was set on things above. Elijah was a man of prayer. Elijah was many things, and we've talked about him enough. Yet even this wonderful story of this wonderful prophet the, the, the point of the author's story isn't about us looking at Elijah and saying, man, we want to be like Elijah. We need to pray harder. We need to love God more. We need to give up more things. That's not the point of the story. The lesson of Elijah's story in the scripture, again, isn't that we have to be brave or devoted, commit, committed to God like this man, Elijah. Elijah, in fact, exists to point you and I to someone far greater. He points us to someone who's more true and more genuine, someone who is going to be able to cash that check. Jesus tells Elijah, Jesus tells us, Elijah and John the Baptist, they have the same call. They're two different people, but they have the same call. What's their mission? What's their call? What did John the Baptist do? They had bad fashion, they ate weird things, but most importantly, their main role was point everyone to who? To Jesus Christ.
John the Baptist, Elijah, and all these great men that we study in the scripture, but not so great men. Together they point us to a Savior who has endured all trials and shame, sin, and ultimately the agony of the cross. The true Messiah took on the righteous wrath of God for our behalf. For the things that we have done and things that we could not have, have done, Jesus did it for us. So that we can find forgiveness and eternal life through him. When we are in that cave and wondering, how can we get out? We can't get out. It's only by Jesus and his life, his death, we are invited out. And Jesus, on that cross and through the tomb, he erased death once and for all. Friends, this is the Savior we worship. This is the reason why we have been in the book of Elijah. Not to say, man, we want to be like Elijah. No, it's we are like Elijah and we cannot do it. And because we couldn't do it, Christ came. He did not only come, he died. Hung on that tree for your sin, for my sin. This is the Savior we worship. He's a shepherd guiding and protecting us on our journey. His voice is the one we recognize and follow. He's our pastor. Jesus is our pastor interceding for us, ensuring that we are never alone in our trials and challenges. Even when we, are, we feel utterly alone in the cave, we are not alone because of our pastor, Jesus Christ. So friends, I want to invite you, let us worship the one that we are not. Let us worship the one who is truly worthy. And again, it's not about you, it's about him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this reminder through the life of Elijah and through the stories in the Bible. Remind us that it's not about us. And Lord, the world... And the enemy wants to sell us on this idea of it's about you, Sangmin. It's about your vision, your purpose, your life. You matter. And so, Lord, would you give us wisdom and discernment to be able to once again come back to the truth, to know that our lives are not ours, that we're not our own masters that we are slaves that, that, that have come to say, Lord, you take the wheel, you take our lives, you tell us how to live. Lord, would you give us courage? If anyone is feeling utterly distant from you, if anyone is feeling utterly discouraged and, and afraid and alone, would you touch them today? Would you remind them again that they're not alone? We thank you. We love you. Just in we pray. Amen.